Yes, so let's get started. And um, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction because Glennis, you know, Glennis needs a long, you know, she's got a long list of accomplishments. I'm just going to keep it very brief. But I want to welcome everyone to today's CDY session. And uh, Glennis is actually closing out our session uh, for, this, for this semester and for the season. It's the last talk before we resume again um, in the fall. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Glennis Farrar for today's talk entitled The Highest Energy Cosmic Race, a review. And I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, Glennis is currently the Collegiate Professor and Julia Silver, Rosalind Silver, and Enid Silver Winslow Professor of Physics at uh, NYU. Uh, her PhD was from Princeton, undergraduate studies at Berkeley, and Glennis has had a long and distinguished career in theoretical particle physics, astrophysics, and cosmology. Uh, she was a member of the Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, she was in the faculties of uh, California Institute of Technology, Rutgers University, before moving to NYU. And she's done, uh, her, her early work was in supersymmetry and theoretical physics, and she's done some seminal work in that area. And recently, her current work focuses mainly on problems at the interaction, uh, intersection of astrophysics, cosmology, and particle physics, ultra high energy cosmic rays, nature of dark matter, dark energy, origin of asymmetry between matter and antimatter. And very recently, I hear in the last two months or so, uh, it's a real honor that uh, Glennis was uh, elected to the National Academy. So huge congratulations and very well deserved. And thank you, Glennis. And uh, we will get started. And just as a reminder to everyone, we will be recording the session for our YouTube archives. And if you're not speaking, please mute. And if you have any questions, I think, Glennis, would you like us to hold it towards the end or just have well, a question? Why don't we start <laughs> by being a little bit flexible? On the other hand, if it seems like we're getting, especially something that needs immediate clarification, uh, right. but okay. I think I think this really material for three hours, and so to kind of get through the entire thing may may require a little self discipline. All right, so let's get started, and then we'll play by the ear. Thank you so much, Glennis, for giving us this talk, and let's get started. Okay, well, I wish we were seeing each other in person, but thank yes. you for <laughs> being here. Um, we're learning to cope with, or have people learned already to cope with Zoom. Um, but anyway, so I took the mandate as mainly trying to distill what's really, to me, the most important takeaways, because from reading the CDY initiative description, it sounded like the main ambition is to understand um, acceleration and what kind of systems can make these remarkably high energy uh, processes that we observe in photons and neutrinos and uh, cosmic rays. And for that purpose, I want to leave modelers with a kind of clear uh, picture of what we know. Um, so my plan is to first highlight the observational things and then spend um, maybe a quarter of the time or so on some, I think, rather generic interpretations that can be made. And I'm going to steer clear of there's been a huge amount of work modeling individual sources, which I'm not even going to talk about, um, just mainly for lack of time. So I think if everyone leaves here uh, with the following uh, clear idea that the composition of ultra energy cosmic rays is certainly not a pure protonic composition, as almost everybody in the field just assumed was going to be the case uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and the composition evolves with energy. I'll go into all of these things in more detail. Um, another thing that is a surprise, I suppose, relative to what was presumed, uh, was that the limiting, the limit on the maximum energy, or actually its rigidity, uh, appears to be coming mainly from the accelerators themselves and the GCK uh, loss of energy and composition uh, evolution through propagation, that's, uh, that affects what we see, but it's not the dominant thing that's cutting off the spectrum. And then the thing that's emerged uh, fairly recently is that the sources seem to be abundant rather than few and powerful. Uh, so that could be very important from a modeling point of view. Um, 
Let's see if I can advance my slides. There I go. So I'm going to start with this slide from uh, Ralph Engel uh, talk, which kind of gives you a sense of all the different ways that a cosmic ray event is uh, observed. And Glenis, if I could interrupt, we yes, don't please. see your advanced slides. We are, you, oh, you're well, still on weird. your title slide. Oh, somehow it says my sharing is paused. Now I, huh? It's not funny. You might want to just exit and restart. The, What's, the, oh, so you didn't see? Let's see. We just it's we do, we're funny. only on it's also it's also sort of not letting me. Um, okay, I'll do a stop share mm -hmm. and try to start share again. Okay, how's that? That's the title slide. Yep, we see it now, but we have. I'm also seeing your your slide. Right. So this is not the slide I meant to share, and I'm not even sure it's the right talk. <laughs> Hang on, let me one more time. Third time is a charm. I say. Yeah. This is what I want. Okay, and now I'll play. Okay, let's just try again. Okay, now this you're on the slide two. you were seeing, I hope, previously, or have you still always on the title slide? We were on the title slide, so now okay. we are on the essential facts. Okay. So the, it's a mixed composition. The energy is not the cutoff is predominantly from the accelerator. And there are many, apparently, this is not absolutely uh, ironclad. Um, they seem to be, however, many fairly weak sources rather than a few powerful sources. Anyway, so here is a uh, very uh, contentful picture, which will give you a little idea for those who aren't familiar with it, with how one makes observations of ultra energy cosmic rays. So here on the uh, coming in, is the imagined ultra energy cosmic ray. It interacts with nuclei in the air, predominantly nitrogen, so it's already complicated because it's not a PP collision that we study at the LHC, for example. Um, if it happens while the fluorescence detector is on, then which happens on dark moonless nights, um, then you actually see this shower development by using uh, this is a schematic of a telescope uh, that actually monitors the sky and there's four of them at O'Shea and two of them at TA overlooking the ground array. And so if you uh, a, a, an event that's detected overnight is great because you can actually date you can measure how the uh, energy in the shower is developing. And so the shape of that longitudinal profile has ex is extremely useful, uh, as, I'll, as I'll get back to it. However, that's only 15% of the time. And so to amplify the statistics, the both OJ and TA and, and some predecessor, OJ was the first hybrid, I believe. Um, but anyway, so they have a big ground array of now it's quite elaborate. Originally with O'Shea, it was only a water scintillator tanks. Now a water uh, Shrenkov tanks. Now they have uh, scintillators on top of them. At TA, it's only scintillators. Each of them brings different information. The more information you have, the better. Um, so I'm going to first mention this very important fact: is if you measure the longitudinal shower, then you get a quite good estimate of the energy because you can simply integrate the energy in the uh that's in the light of that that's created by that cosmic ray because as it goes along it starts the tremendous energy in one particle but by the time it gets to the sort of peak of the shower you have i forget the number now i want to say 10 to the seventh particles each with several gev of energy um and there's most of the shower development is electromagnetic. It's pretty well understood, but not perfectly. This is one of the main systematics, is how much invisible energy there is. So that would be things like um, neutrinos, uh, but other things are effectively invisible. Um, but the idea of this whole hybrid technique is that you can calibrate the energy of by for the showers you observe with a fluorescence detector, you can actually directly integrate to get what's called the calorimetric energy, 
then with a when you, if you know the fluorescence yield because this is fluorescence well, light and not all of the energy goes to fluorescence light but there's a conversion factor that's measured um you know that and you can make this a, a missing energy correction then you get the calorimet the, then you get the the actual cosmic ray energy and there's about a 15 percent 10 to 10 to 20 percent let me say uh, uncertainty in that. And of course, you want to measure the atmosphere extremely well, because if there's dust, that attenuates the signal and, and, and so on. So these to get precisions of this level is really quite an endeavor. A recent thing that's happened at Auger is adding radio detectin, which enables you to see the showers even during the day. Um, the, and, and then the workhorse is a surface detector which has at OJ, it has 1600 um, uh, water shrink off counters that covers uh, 3000 square kilometers. TA is, uh, I'll show, I'll give the data later, but it's maybe a factor of five smaller. It uh, has four times smaller surface array, um, but otherwise it's fairly similar in its, uh, in its general structure. The idea of the surface array is that you measure these little red dots down, red and yellow dots down here represent uh, the water detectors at O'Shea, which, and how strong a signal they have. And so you can learn the direction. The, is, the directions are known to sort of half a degree. Uh, and you learn the direction, but you can also learn the energy to a certain approximation by looking at the lateral uh, distribution of, of signal in these water tanks. And so here's an example of a lateral distribution. And then the idea is that this lateral distribution, this is a conclusion from modeling really, that if you measure, if you fit it to a certain functional form, which is, sorry, uh, which is somewhat constrained theoretically, but mainly observationally, then the energy of the shower can be determined by the signal strength in this fit at a particular distance. So, sorry, I keep messing this up. So in OJ, it's at a thousand uh, meters. There's a different scheme for TA, but it's, it's uh, basically the same idea. And then using so-called hybrid events, uh, you, where you measure both, you learn the mapping between the ground, uh, the, the ground signal and the uh, this calorimetric energy. So that's basically the plan. And roughly speaking, the energy uh, um, is known, as I was saying, to 10 to 15 percent for Roche. Um, the main, so this is now things I'm going to assert in the course of the talk. One is this thing I mentioned already that the rigidity cutoff, that's not to say nothing is seen above this rigidity, but the spectrum starts to drop. It's no longer just a power law, but it starts to drop faster, like an exponential, um, is it only at about five ectovolts? So I'm always, the thing that's powerful to remember, but not that many people understand it, that's why I'm trying to emphasize it, is that this is really quite universal. And the, so we do see particles with higher energies, but when we see protons, this is generally their maximum energy, because of course they have Z equal one, and so they're in the, Rigidity is directly their energy. But if you have silicon, this would correspond to a 70 EV silicon, and, and you can do the arithmetic for yourself. Um, and so I'll show you as in the course of the talk, how, wh why this, why we think we know this. Um, the, the two items I underlined are the ones I'm gonna talk about first. To come back to these, I'm gonna come back, well, I'm gonna come back to this top one, but I have to lay a little groundwork. So I'm going to first talk about the spectrum that's been measured. And another really important takeaway I, I want you to come away with is that Auger and TA agree within the observational uncertainties um, on basically everything. Uh, I'll show you where there seem to be some differences. But the so there was a long period when it the, the kind of public discussion sort of suggested otherwise. Um, but that's largely been resolved. Um, there may be one or two people, old timers on TA, let's say, um, who maybe w want a different interpretation. But 
really the whole collaboration and working groups uh, on all the different topics between OJ and TA have, have um, determined that this is the case. So that very much, um, I would say, strengthens the ability of theorists to draw conclusions from the data. One of the original, uh, let's say, uh, the, the underlying reason it took a while to get here is that thanks to the fact that Auger was so much larger and had uh, the fluorescence and, and ground array at the same time, they were able to do a direct energy calibration like I described sooner than TA could because you have to throw away a lot of events uh, which may be coming in at, at angles you can't interpret properly in order to do that energy calibration robustly. Whereas TA had to do modeling of air showers using uh, event generators in order to be able to interpret their energy calibration. And now that um, TA has more statistics, it's able to do more the, the OJ style thing, and, and now they're agreeing. And then a fact that's just uh, useful to keep in the back of your mind is that at the lowest, at, at below about uh, 1 EEV, 10 to the 18th electron volts, um, there's, you, you, that's about where the galactic cosmic rays really end. Um, but below that, you have a combination of the lowest energy extra galactic and the highest energy galactic cosmic rays. Okay, so this is, uh, maybe I'll go through this quickly. Um, this is one of these examples of the working groups between OJ and TA on the energy spectrum. This shows the two uh, energy spectra, OJ in black and TA in blue, um, from the last, th th there are these ICRCs every two years, and there's going to be another one in, in August. Um, and then that's when all the new data gets released. In any event, um, at this workshop, which was last fall in, um, in, in the Gran Sasso lab, uh, the U UHECR 22, um, the work, this working group presented its results. Luckily for this talk, there are lots of new results that came out then, so I can share them with you. In any event, so you see that there's an offset, um, and now that's basically understood. This is what I alluded to, just showing how each of the uh, experiments. TA is, of course, in the north and OJ in the southern hemisphere. Um, I will skip over this and the slides will be available, I assume, so you can go back and look more uh, slowly. Uh, this is what I was mentioning about the hybrid technique before, that you have an air shower, which you observe in the case of TA, they have a kind of eye-like thing. Uh, in the case of OJ, it's got a different geometry, but either way, it's a set of telescopes. And then you also measure it on the ground. And this is just showing characteristic data. This would be a, uh, an OJ longitudinal profile and, and uh, ground away. And this is a, a TA one. Um, this goes, you know, as an energy budget uh, showing uh, what the different things are that go into the systematic uncertainties in determining the energy. So there's this. Fluorescence yield, I mentioned, how much does an excited air atom release in fluorescence light? Interestingly, that's extremely hard to measure. Here's a little plot of it. Um, and over the years, its value has moved around a lot. And for historic reasons, TA uses a 1996, uh, um, I don't remember which one it is on here, maybe it's this one. Um, they just for their, they just consider it useful to stick with one, but it's been now much better measured and actually that difference accounts for most of the OJTA uh, difference in energies in that plot. Oh, I should have moved back and said, whoops, let me go back here to this, where is it, to this plot. Remember, when you see these things are multiplied by a high power of energy here, e to the 2.6. And that means that a small change in, like say a 10% uh, change in the energy uh, reconstruction will make a 26% difference in how high they are on this plot. And so uh, that's why a small change in, in the calibration can make what looks to the eye like a big discrepancy. 
anyway, these are the uh, experiments, uh, their own internal uh, statements about what their energy resolution is right now. Uh, one of the things that's really exciting that maybe isn't so well known outside the field is how precisely the spectra have now been measured. The spectrum has now been measured. Um, the, this is showing, it's a, this is now already almost two years old. I guess this data was from TA in 2019, but it's what the working group chose to work with. Um, and one of the things you see is this quite detailed structure. Um, thus, I think in August, we're gonna see even more uh, on, on this, uh, but both experiments see it. Um, let's see, why am I? This is measuring the full sky and making a correction at low energies to just bring them into consistency, not choosing which one is right, but splitting the difference. Um, and then you see there's this residual discrepancy at high energies, uh, the ratio is shown over here and at the very, very highest energies, um, it looks like uh, Auger is seeing only 10% of what TA is seeing. Um, one of the very fascinating suggestions is that TA is looking one direction and Auger is looking the other, maybe the spectra are different. Uh, but that seems not to be the case now, um, because there's a fairly large region of sky which both uh, experiments can see, this uh, common declination band from about minus 15 to plus 25 uh, de uh, degrees. And in that band, one sees that there's still a difference. It's not as statistically robust as the all sky one because there are fewer data points. Um, but in any event, if you were to fit this figure to a function, it would be sufficient to explain the all sky difference. So my takeaway is that as of now, the difference in the TA and OJ spectra is likely to be some instrumental thing that's not yet understood. Um, and that for now, uh, the evidence is very weak, uh, maybe I would say there's almost no evidence of a real direction of field difference in the spectrum, um, but it could be there, there could be some uh, hidden in, in all of the statistics. Okay, well trying to push along, uh, and, and if I guess I could pause here for a couple of questions if someone wants to ask. Okay, well, it, and if I'm going too slowly or anything like that, just speak up. I can, I can add more slides and, um, and so on. Okay, so the things I want to talk about about composition are this evidence that the composition becomes heavier, and that um, the other thing is that, as I said in early days, TA uh, was arguing that it was a pure proton composition, and now uh, they no longer say that and I want to report on the working group studies that led to that conclusion. Now, um, a thing I'm going to come back to is this issue that going from the observational data to an interpretation in terms of what is the actual mass composition of the nuclei, you know, the nucleus that's the ultra energy cosmic ray, that requires um, ultra energy uh, particle physics modeling, uh, both nuclear and particle. Uh, and so I'll come back to that, but I won't address it right away, because right now I'm going to try to focus on the observational um, facts. OK, so the, here on the right is a picture of one of these shower profiles. Remember in the slide where I was, uh, the very busy slide at the beginning, where I'm showing, if you have a fluorescence observation, you know that you can see the shower profile. Well, that's what this shower profile is, and it's invariably uh, trans. It's very. It's always quoted in terms of column depth in the atmosphere at because depending on what sorry what direction the shower comes in, the mapping from physical distance to the amount of material traversed. Uh, changes. So you make it uniform by 
talking about this depth, which is invariably denoted capital X, and its units are grams per square centimeter. Um, so a shower has a general shape like this, and it's governed by two things. Uh, one is, I'm, I'm making it a little bit simplified. One is, where does, how deep is the first interaction in the atmosphere? And in this uh, slide is called delta X1. And that's quite different depending on what the particle is. If it's a proton, and, and so if it's a proton, it, which has a smaller cross-section than an iron nucleus, let's say, then the proton on average will, uh, will penetrate more deeply before it has its first interaction. So for iron, X1 is small, and for proton, um, X1 is big the, on average. Furthermore, the spread in the first interaction depth is very different. Iron is so massive, it interacts almost all, there's very little fluctuations in when its first interaction occurs. And whereas for air, uh, for protons, there's much more variation. And so there's, that's what this delta X1 refers to. And the, the sort of sigma of X1 proton is encapsulating this difference. So the spread in where the iron interacts first is only about 10 grams per centimeter squared. But the spread in where a proton interacts first is more like 50 grams per centimeter squared. So you see there's two different qualitative features between a, a proton and a, a heavier nucleus. Um, once it's interacted, there's a model dependence that depends on how the final hadrons uh, emerge from the interaction. Some of the time um, in a high energy proton nucleus collision, the, there's a great deal of forward energy that is almost diffractive. Other times, the, uh, it's much more inelastic and the energy is, is divided up between multiple final particles much more uniformly. And that tells how fast it goes, how, how quickly it takes for the shower profile to reach maximum. So going from here to here also varies. And it's another reason that iron is much, or heavy nuclei are much more uniform because inevitably the final products of the collision are much more numerous. And so therefore just the statistical averaging aspect uh, washes out uh, the differences in, in where you actually reach the shower peak. Most of this is I mean, something like 90% of this energy is electromagnetic and the evolution of electromagnetic showers is, is quite well understood. So the main uncertainty in this whole process, besides the fluorescent shield and um, you know, how clean the sky is, things like that, the sort of the observational aspects, but from a theoretical standpoint, the main uncertainty has to do with this par particle physics. And so there have been a variety of models that people have tried to develop, and as I'll come in the next slide, um, to uh, a little bit of discussion about that. But here are model predictions from three different models that are, well, now the Sybil one has advanced to a more advanced Sybil, uh, but these are almost the latest uh, models. And so what you see is the, uh, Points with the funny error bars are the OJ data. The, um, there's ones called FD for fluorescence detectors and ones called SD, which I'll come back to that in a second. You see the SD ones extend to higher energy. Um, and the different error bars are, the smaller one, well, there's different kinds of systematic error bars that are being shown here. And then these things are sometimes called rails, are the predicted X max, uh, mean X max in these different shower models. And uh, it's in grams per centimeter squared. So for example, EPOS is the one, the dark one. And you can see already that different models uh, predict sort of a 10 grams per square centimeter spread between EPOS. 
And now iron is way down here. Well, I shouldn't say way down here, but it's down here, but as we expected. And if we were to draw the lines for different nuclei, they would be in here. Uh, here's sigma x max. And what makes sigma x max uh, tricky to think about if you haven't gone through it in your mind is that there's two things that contribute to it. One is the intrinsic uh, distribution that we were talking about for a single nucleus. But in addition, if you have multiple nuclei, say you had um, your, your, your cosmic rays or a combination of protons and iron, let's say, well, then you get an additional spread because at a given energy, there's nearly 100 grams uh, or around 100 grams per centimeter squared just because you have protons and iron. And so an immediate takeaway from this, which is, I think, uh, very important for people to understand, is that the fact that this is dropping so fast and is so much smaller than 100 grams per square centimeter is intrinsically a sign of something I'm going to argue is quite puzzling, which is that the um, composition appears to be rather pure. Because if, oh, sorry, so if, I can't seem to, my, my finger is heavy today or something. You see, if you, supposing you sat here at 10 to the 19, and you can interpret that x max as let's say I'm going to round off, I'm going to say partly, well, I'll, I'll try to do a better job. Between proton and iron, let's say this is nitrogen, maybe. In fact, that's probably what it is. Um, that, so that a nitrogen would explain this, or if you were just trying to get the average X max, you could say it's 30% uh, proton, I'm sorry, 60% uh, proton and 40% iron, for example. Those are either one of those is a fine explanation for this. But over here, to get such a small x max of spread in the x max has been observed. This is an event to event spread. Um, that tells us immediately that it has to be a fairly pure, uh, a fairly pure mixture. If if that wasn't clear, well maybe as I, maybe people all know this. I, I wish I could see you and I could tell whether I'm telling you know if stuff that you know or not. Um, but anyway, I can't. So, sorry about that. All right. Well, I'm going to assume for now you understand it, and 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 please, uh, someone, speak up or raise hands or ask at the end if you have questions. This is a plot of the inferred Bioge uh, composition as a function of energy. It's often plotted. It's plotted in different ways, and I thought this was the most transparent. But in, in this plot, they've lumped together. Uh, sometimes they do, you have to look very closely at when they, they interpret it, how they've been there, uh, the ranges of A. And so often it's, it's into four bins where these two highest uh, mass bins are combined. And the reason is that then you get kind of uniform spacing in the logarithm of A. But in any event, this picture shows, because we know pretty well for the galactic, so to the left, you see a mixture of galactic and extragalactic. So red is protons. And you see, we get quite a lot of protons here in this 10 to the 18 to, and then to the 18.7 uh, or so range. Um, those are exclusively extragalactic, I would say. We can discuss that later. Um, however, the iron and silicon and whatnot that you're getting at, at these energies is very likely uh, the highest energy galactic cosmic rays. But focusing over here, which is the extragalactic part, which I was supposed to talk about, you see that, for example, this entire uh, range according to this fit is dominated by this what's often called intermediate masses sort of CNO uh, is one of the most common uh, things this this one uh, here this one here would include helium and deuterium and so on and this is the protons um, 
And then this is more massive stuff. And you see the more massive stuff is, is subdominant. Um, this is the direct fits from this interpretation. This is the prediction. That's what the solid lines here for X max and, and sigma X max. Um, one of the things that uh, is implicit in this picture is that this is roughly consistent with the so-called Peter cycle, which says that the um, energies are going to be from a particular, for, for an individual accelerator, since acceleration is uh, electromagnetic, the acceleration will only depend on the rigidity. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that what you see only depends on the rigidity because things get processed after the fact. But roughly speaking, this idea of a Peter cycle, which says that the composition would, which would predict that the composition would evolve such that the rigidity spectrum was constant, that seems to be roughly borne out. Another thing I, I'm going to call your attention to, because to my mind, it's one of the most interesting, maybe for theorists, the most interesting and puzzling features of what we know, is that this is quite a narrow range. Um, and so at each given, the, the, the different element bins peak up and drop off rather slow, quickly. It's sort of a factor of three in energy. Um, and why that should be, if you have, I'm going to telegraph to me one of the interesting questions. If we assume, as I think is natural, to imagine there's lots of different kinds of accelerators out there, they're not stand, I would not have expected them to be standard candles. Then it seems to me quite hard to understand why they, why we would see apparently these narrow, uh, this sort of narrow one to one mapping between energy and charge. So we can come back to that at the discussion at the end. Uh, maybe again, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll speed through this, but this is a, a report of a different working group between uh, TA and OJ. This is their slides, the first and last slides from the this workshop last, last uh, fall that I mentioned. And this is showing their plot of what the average X max is as a function of energy interpreted by, as inferred by Auger and as, uh, wait, sorry, I'm not saying this right. The blue is the TA data points and the pink is what TA would expect to see if the composition were the same as Auger's. And the blue is the systematic uncertainty. And so you see that the deviations are all within the systematic uncertainties. Um, and uh, similarly, the sigma X maxes mostly agree, but there's a couple of data points that are different. But here down here says that um, the degree disagreement is possibly due to the handling of the X max resolution uh, due to varying aerosols. So Oche, uh for every single ultra cosmic ray event, they measure using LIDAR the aerosols in the air. And so there's a correction event by event, whereas TA just assumes that their atmosphere is identical all the time. And so that's why you would expect them to get a bigger sigma X max. Um, okay, so now, gee, maybe I should again give a pause uh, to let people ask a question if they want. I'm going to now move on a, sort of away from the, the data to attempts to make sense of it and interpret it. Uh, OK, all right. Well, I don't see any. Oh, I do see a hand. Uh, Pratik. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, so if I can you please go back to the plot where you were differentiating between the uh, galactic, extragalactic, and pure extragalactic mixture. And yeah, oh, one. okay, here so, it is. Yeah. So, if just to, I have a naive question, just to understand the whole thing, is that the fact that you say that the protons, you would say that they are mostly extragalactic here, simply because that if they were galactic, they would have cut off at much lower energies. Well, Do I understand the, that? No, it's, it's kind correct? of you. You've got the right. Uh, um, 
idea, but I probably didn't articulate it very well. But it's basically, there's two things. One is that even in this range, you see most of this is multiplied by E cubed, so it's a little bit sometimes deceptive, but most of the area in this plot is coming from these lighter components in this range. Below 18, below 10 to the 18th, below one EEV, then it really starts to be dominated by uh, extragalactic. But this is a sort of special narrow range above one EEV. And in it, there's this small component of very high mass. And we would just imagine that that's a natural extension of the uh, I, I would just imagine uh, that it's a natural extension of the galactic cosmic ray. So there was, as you correctly pointed out, I was not making a statement about the direct observation. However, there is observational evidence that the bulk of the cosmic rays, which according to this fit are light ones, there is observational that they are extragalactic because the dipole in the anisotropy, which I'll come to later, um, continues to be similar. It evolves very slowly from the dipole that's observed here, which I'll talk about, and then it gradually converts over to a dipole that more points to the galactic center. And that's really down here more at 18, at 17.6 or so. So there's a region here where there's definitely light extragalactic components. That's very well established, I would say, from not just not just prejudice, but um, or theoretical thinking, but also from the uh, this anisotropy. Thank you for asking because I had not. Yeah, th th I, thanks uh, a lot for that because I was missing that anisotropy point. Yeah, okay, that's, that's why I hadn't I exactly. hadn't said it. I had yeah. just uh, yeah, okay, okay, very good. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right, well, I will uh, plow on. I saw there was a something in the chat. Oh, <laughs> so the answer to your chat. Uh, Pratik was, uh, yes, please raise your hand and I'll do my best to to seeing them. Or just shout if if uh, uh, if if I'm being blind. OK, um, now continuing now I'm going to shift to the problem of interpreting the data. Um, so, as I said, these are the leading models. There's another model that's been around for a long time, QGS jet, but it is somehow disfavored these days because it doesn't model well, nearly as well as either of these two individual showers or the shapes of the distributions and so on. Um, both of these two, and I think maybe now the latest version of QGS Jet, have been tuned to LHC data. Let me say in parentheses something I didn't put on the slide, is that the LHC data doesn't exist in the region you really need it. Well, first of all, the first interaction is far beyond the energy range of LHC. It's easily 10 times higher than the LHC energies. But a huge amount of the shower development is coming from the secondaries, um, well, which are dominantly pions and kaons and so on, whereas, of course, LHC doesn't use uh, pions and kaons as one of their beams. Um, and then even more important, in my opinion, is that the detectors in the LHC mostly are at roughly 90 degrees in the center of mass or you know covers 10 to 170 degrees in the center of mass whereas for the ultra high g cosmic ray shower evolution the ones that are the very most important are the very highest energy ones because the low energy ones just deposit their energy and that's pretty straightforward to model. But the very high energy ones are the ones that propagate the shower deeply into the atmosphere. And there is, although they say they're tuned to LHC data, there isn't data in the regime that is really the most pertinent. There's a lot of, uh, there's discussions of doing dedicated experiments at the LHC and other ones at, um, uh, another accelerator at the LHC, uh, at, at, at CERN, that will be getting the data that's needed to interpret uh, atmospheric showers. So please lend your voices if you're interested in this topic, as, you know, write an email to CERN, we could discuss later who you would write it to, um, to encourage them about the importance of this. Um, all right, anyway, there are um, discrepancies uh, uh, 
I, that I was mentioning that the data, um, uh, it's, it's not a wonder because these haven't actually, there is not the data you need to tune it. In addition to the problem that it's also much higher energy and the uh, projectiles aren't the ones that you need. Uh, so there, I would say several distinct discrepancies that are, have emerged. One that is now very solid is that there are significantly more muons observed in the showers on the ground where you can detect that there are muons because the water tanks have visibly different signals depending on whether they're muons or electrons. That's not true for the scintillators used by TA, but at OJ, that's that's an observable question, question, and it's been now studied really very well. Um, another problem with the models that's been emerging lately, uh, I think predominantly from an OJ analysis, is that the models systematically predict too deep an X max. Um, that would mean that this is preliminary, and but I think it's getting to be pretty robust. That would mean that the actual, if that were true, the cor a corrected model, if we knew how to correct them, would uh, predict that the composition, or would conclude from the data that the composition is heavier than in those plots I was showing earlier. Okay, just that's the takeaway. It's not, it's not certain yet. You might wonder, how is it possible to distinguish if you don't know uh, what's muon and what's not? How can you distinguish? And the trick is to use the fact that the, as a function of zenith angle, the path length in the atmosphere is different and muons penetrate more deeply. And so by combining the fluorescence measurements and uh, the early experiments just integrated over all the zenith angles, but now when you do a, a plot, both of, of the depth and the zenith angle, you can, um, you can disentangle these two effects. So I say it's still preliminary, but you'll start to hear more and more about this, I think. There's other funny uh, things that don't fit very well. There's a way to estimate the muon production depth that OJ uses um, basically by, you know, if you see the muons on the ground, the showers can extend several kilometers. And so you can triangulate to work out where they started in the sky, because once they're produced, they basically just go straight. And that doesn't agree with models either. So uh, I think there's a certain amount of improvements in the models that will make interpreting ultra cosmic data much easier. But at the same time, although I want to indicate these uh, caveats in the interpretations, they're still quite accurate. So maybe we don't know whether it's uh, nitrogen or, or uh, something heavier like silicon uh, too well. The fact that it's not protonic is, is really very clear. Okay, now, all right, so I have not left myself enough time, but that's always what happens. Um, I want to quickly talk about what we can say with some confidence about the sources. And my first comment that I needed to make is that source ID is complicated relative to if you're looking at photons or neutrinos because the charged particles get deflected. And their Larmor radius in a one microgauss field that remember the magnetic field of the galaxy is a few microgauss in some regions it could be as much as 10 microgauss in the outer galaxy it's it's smaller like one microgauss but anyway it's a, a kiloparsec for a particle with a rigidity of an ectovolt and we were just arguing that the peak rigidity is around five ectovolts as it turns out um, and so that means that a typical Larmor radius is around a kiloparsec for those typical cosmic rays. And of course, they have to travel 10, 20 uh, kiloparsecs through this field, and so they can be quite deflected. This is an example of some calculations that Mike Sutherland and I, I did some years ago to illustrate if you had a source at M82 as a function of the, the uh, rigidity here I've translated it into 
particle, uh, you know, to nucleus and energy. So, for example, a 60 eV uh, proton would just hardly deflect. At 32 eV, it would hardly deflect. 10 eV, it still doesn't deflect much. And then down here, it, there's a fascinating phenomenon. It's sort of almost all directions in sky. There's a sharp break below 10 ectovolts when it, it uh, sort of sprays out the arrival directions. And this is just showing three different examples. Uh, that's because once they get to such low rigidities, then, the, um, then they deflect enough that the, they get sort of captured by the field in the galactic plane in, most, in many directions. Uh, there's another phenomenon I just want to mention because it's so fascinating, is that there's a magnification and demagnification effect. So in this plot, this it's hard to see the print. I should have. This one is at um, three thirty uh, ectovolts. This one is at ten ectovolts, and this one is at three ectovolts. So this is maybe representative. The red regions are magnifications and the scale is a log scale. Red is a magnification of a factor of 30. Blue is a, a demagnification of a factor of 30 or more. And so what you see is that if you're in a region, and this is showing as a function of where the source is, how the flux that we receive is going to be modified due to the magnifi magnification effect. It's easy to understand. This is just saying that if a particle has to come through the center of the galaxy to reach you, the chances that it actually makes it through and doesn't just get deflected away, um, because right, the magnetic fields are largely perpendicular to its trajectory. So there's a very strong uh, Lorentz force. The, the, it essentially always gets deflected away and doesn't come to us. On the other hand, since overall flux is conserved, that's compensated by particles which coming from sources in this region are almost focused on us. And so if your favorite source happens to be up here, you will get a much bigger flux than if your favorite source happens to, happens to be down here. Okay, no. but also the most important uh, takeaway to my view is that it's very difficult to interpret um, the uh, Unless we get to the point we can individually find cosmic rays with a high rigidity, uh, it'll be pretty hard to interpret individual sources. Uh, Michael Unger and I are just finally, after years and years of working on this, coming out with a, um, well, to call it an update of JF12, Janssen Farrar 2012 model, which has been the workhorse of the field. Um, it's been really an ordeal. And now we've come up with of order six or eight. Actually, we, we study 30 different variants using different input data because there's some uncertainty about the synchrotron emission data and, and, and so on, um, using different models for the electron density and the scale height and so on. And what we did is we found the, here's JF12, here's our new base model. But all of these other models, we picked them to have the most different deflections. We have something like 30 different model variations that we studied. And amongst those, we found the ones that were the worst from the standpoint of how uncertain is it. And what this is doing, and this is for 20 EV, just because the plot gets hard to see if it, you go down to the 5 EV, that would be more realistic. What this shows is it's computation extremely expensive to do what Mike Sutherland and I done did and that hasn't yet been done for this these new field models what we can do easily though is to say supposing you see a particle coming into you here where do you infer its source was and what that's what so this for example if we see a particle here there's this much uncertainty even within this improved suite of models about where its uh, source was you see there's some directions where it's less bad but in every direction, it's pretty bad. Uh, OK, so that's a warning. Um, therefore, I think you need to have indirect constraints on sources. Um, 
and that's what I was going to talk about. But I, well, I guess we started five minutes late. So I give my, may I give myself a couple more minutes? Yes, yes, please. Uh, all right, so there are two different ones I was going to discuss. Um, one is uh, work with Marco Musio, uh, who's now um, on ARA. He's, he was a student of mine and now a postdoc at PSU. Um, and this is developed, this is making use of a model that Mikko Unger, uh, Luis Nanjiorki, and I introduced in 2015. Our idea was to not model a particular uh, source well but to try to get generic properties of the source. And the idea was that surrounding some source, I mean, maybe your source is a starburst galaxy and inside you've had various uh, tidal disruption events over time, or maybe there's an AGN in the center or whatever. Um, as, the, as the cosmic ray uh, indicated in pink here, makes this, and of course the deflections may be quite exaggerated depending on the magnetic fields inside this, this source region. Um, but as it's getting out, it, it collides with gas or photons in, in the source and it will photo disintegrate or have a photohedronic, uh, just a hadronic interaction. And its composition will be broken down if it's a nucleus. Um, Anyway, as a result of all of this, we can see different messengers uh, that are emitted in this process. And now, of course, once the cosmic ray is out, um, it will have additional photo, the regular GZK type interactions in the EBL as it gets to us. But those we, we model um, because those are, those are pretty well known. Anyway, in this framework, which we, we they keep thing you can fit is the ratio of uh, the escape time and the interaction time. And then uh, th 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 let me show you what these different plots show. So this is the injected spectrum. And to simplify matters, we just injected a silicon, which gives an excellent fit to the data. But for reasons that I, I can explain after, it hardly matters as long as you, as long as the, what you inject at least include silicon. Then the this is what happens as it's exiting according to the best fit models. This is shows how beautifully it fits the data, not only for the spectrum, but also the uh, this is X max and sigma X max. This is an old plot from 2015 uh, where the data was much less good, but now it's really it's really very good. And one thing to notice is how larger fraction of the primaries is been fragmented in this model all of these intermediate masses whose uh these are just fragments essentially of the initial nucleus and so their energies are basically uh scaled by the original um, energy divided by a but now you see the origin of even in a model like this the dependence only on rigidity because for everything but proton, the rigidity is just proportional to the energy per nucleon. Anyway, so this is what is exiting the accelerator, I mean, ex exiting the source environment. And then it propagates to Earth through the extragalactic background light, giving this final spectrum in our picture. Now there's a smoking gun for this mechanism, namely that the peak of the proton energy is in fact the end, the maximum energy here divided by a so this means the protons are not being directly uh, accelerated because they would peak here if it was just based on the, their own charge um, instead they're they're peaking here which is reflecting the original rigidity all right so taking that as evidence for this kind of approach. And, and right, there's many different ways you could realize that approach. Uh, Kota Marase has done a bunch of work on different concrete sources, uh, winter. There's a whole lot of people. I, I didn't attempt to put a list because it's a very long list of people who've explored different particular sources. Anyway, but what we can do is we can fit the data. This is the, fit, the latest fit that was in a paper that Marco and I uh, just published in FJ letters. Um, and this predicts the neutrino spectrum, 
find a good fit. It shows that it's not in contradiction with the Fermi lat diffuse uh, gamma rays. Anyway, one of the things I wanted to show um, to this audience who's interested in, in modeling the, I think modeling the uh, acceleration is that the injected injection index can, well, sorry, I guess I've moved on. It's okay, I'll move on. The injection index of the best fit includes a value that's perfectly fine for Dvusak acceleration. And I wanted to stress this because a lot of the OJ fits or other people's fits to the spectrum are looking, they report spectral indices that are extremely hard, harder than um, e to the minus one. And you have to keep in mind that's the spectral index emerging from the environment. And in fact, if there's a magnetic field around it, and there are magnetic fields around it, and we find that we need them, I'll go into that. As they emerge from the environment, the highest energy ones can escape easier without being disintegrated so much relative to the lower energy ones. And so that naturally hardens the spectrum. Uh, how much it hardens it depends on you know, what the environment is like. In our best fits, it hardens it enough to accommodate diffusive shock acceleration with an accelerator index of something like minus two. Now, these are all the parameters that characterize in our in the fits the, the sports environment. But I want to focus on two of them. Uh, the temperature in the source environment can't be too high, because if it is, that shapes the final spectrum quite differently than what we see. And secondly, it, it will constrain the magnetic field and the size of the source. So let me quickly show here this plot from our paper, which shows the, this is assuming you have a photon density like a black body and just doing the best fit, but we also cover other cases. But anyhow, um, this illustrates that this is where you'd like to be, and the dark regions are the best posterior. And this shows how different, um, if you assume n equals one, which isn't true for all of these, but just to show, and, and there's a simple prescription of how this plot moves. But what you see is that, I'll move to the next plot. Um, you, you can get a constraint. It's analogous to the Hillis criterion. And interestingly, since we have a model that tells us what the energy actually was of, of the, and the rigidity, we know what the Hellish criterion is. And it's interesting, it's only slightly stronger than this one here. Um, anyway, so very quickly, you could uh, conclude from, from this analysis that massive galaxy clusters, as appealing as they are, are strongly disfavored. Their temperature is way too high to describe this uh, breakdown process. Um, and furthermore, uh, the magnetic fields that they, um, that, that they, they don't fall where they need to fall um, on this, uh, in this, magnetic field size relation. A few radio lobes of AGNs seem to be a problem because of the temperature. I'm happy to discuss all of these things afterwards with anyone who wants. I don't know whether internal shocks and jets uh, can work. Um, this temperature constraint is very uh, tricky. It has to be able to get out after all. It's not enough that just in the immediate surrounding, it has to get all the way out of the galaxy. So um, then there, and, and to very, very quickly mention, uh, we can also with Teresa Bisser uh, obtain uh, constraints on the source density. Um, Allard and collaborators have recently done some work on this. Uh, it's not as, as sort of systematic as ours, but anyway, the gist of the idea is that this is the observed dipole anisotropy up here above 80 EV and above 32 EV. And as Noemi Globus uh, and my student Chen Ding and I showed, taking the sources to be extra, to be imp whatever they are, imagining that they are uniformly sampling in a continuous way the large scale structure that infers by the cosmologists, um, 
produces what you could call an illumination map. Um, and then you account for the magnetic field deflections. And we found a pretty good accounting of the dipole magnitude and direction and energy dependence. Our work was only, uh, let's say, a first step because we didn't self consistently treat the loss of energy during propagation. And now with Noemi, with Teresa Bister, we've done that. And so now I think our, our results are much more robust. And I think we'll be able to, with the, the new um, UF23 field models, start to say quite definitive things. Um, so one of the things we noticed is that the best fit comes when there's no bias, namely the sources uh, have a faithful um, mapping onto the large scale density. It's not like the highest density regions um, are giving most of the contribution. You really need the low density regions to get the right dipole and things like that. So that's pretty interesting. And the thing I wanted to talk about in closing is the conclusions, which I think are very strong now on what's the maximum density of sources, a minimum density of sources. So I'm going to. So the idea is the continuum model gives a good fit to the dipole. And so what we do is we, for each of several a half a dozen assumptions about what the source density is, we create a thousand source catalogs based on sampling the distribution at certain densities. I think you follow what I mean. And now for each of those, we can compare what's the dipole amplitude or the direction or the dipole direction combined and how often do you so if you get a very high source density say 10 to the minus 1 or 10 to the minus 2 per cubic megaparsec then it's very much like the successful continuum model but as the source density gets low those things are more dominated by random uh, effects and you get a worse and worse this is the where where you agree with uh, 60 percent agreement with the continuum uh, limit so and then this is an even more powerful one, I would say, because this is extremely insensitive to the magnetic field model, is the angular power spectrum. What Auger sees is the black data, and these are all the data points of Auger hidden down here um, for the power spectrum. This is the quadrupole and the octopole and so on. And for this is the same thing for a higher a higher energy cut and what you see is that in all of them and the gray band is the 95% confidence level area if you. Um, if it's just statistical it's a isotropic distribution with statistical fluctuations and you see all of the data points, except the first one are within this 95% confidence plan. But as soon as you have a density that's more than around 10 to the minus three per cubic megaparsec, that's the yellow one, most of them are predicted to be outside. And so anyhow, the upshot of all of this is that we, we, we will wait until we do the analyses with the improved magnetic field models. But I would say right now, the evidence is really very strong that either the anisotropy we see is totally accidental or it is pointing to a very successful model of the anisotropy would be that it's following the distribution of mass and that um, and that sources are really quite abundant. Okay, so I think that's uh, I'm now ready to summarize. I've, I hope I've said it so strongly that there's an agreement on the section one composition. Uh, the rigidity roughly ends at 5 eV. The peak of the rigidity is around 5 eV. The spectrum of the extragalactic particles extend down to protons and helium, but those are, are generally in this 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 18.3 rate region. And the uh, composition is getting heavier. And uh, I mentioned some options for interpretation. So maybe I, I apologize that it, I guess I, I should turn to questions. 
but this is this is a good good place to turn to questions. Uh, this slide. Thank you, Glennis. That was a really excellent summary. Uh, Felix will lead oh, the discussion. Wait, wait, wait. I want to end with this puzzle, okay. which is just to remind you. I just want to put it up here to remind you how can the is it really it seems like it's really true that this factor of three range in this mapping of comp of of rigidity to energy uh, of composition to energy is so narrow. It seems like superficially it's telling us that maybe sources have different cutoffs, but whatever that they don't have different in, in energy, but they don't have different cutoffs in rigidity, or at least a very narrow range, a factor of, of three different cutoffs in rigidity. So to me, this must be either we have to find some explanation that this could be true, or it's telling us something really important about the acceleration mechanism. Okay, sorry. Thank you. And now you know we can have you. So I'm going to turn this over to Felix. So I, I thank you again for the great talk. And if people have questions, please raise your hands. So I had a quick question before we turn this over. Um, so you you showed a plot on um, ruling out possible types of sources and active galaxy jets. Yes. Uh, AGN. Let's see if I can find that. This towards, I think towards you. Yeah. Yes, this one. So the takeaway here is AGN jets and shocks and jets may not be the sources that we're looking for? Or? They, they may be viable, but it's not clear that they are. Certain regions of the jets, like the radio lobes, will be really difficult because they've got such high temperatures. Um, but I think it really, the, the AGNs are so complex because they have all these, it's like a, like a Russian doll with lots of different regions. And so analyzing them is, is tricky. I suppose one possibility is that the ultra energy cosmic rays we see have found a particular escape path and in other directions where they can't kind of escape without being overly decimated and, and too much processed. Maybe in, in those other regions, um, they produce uh, neutrinos that we see or something like that, but without any associated cosmic rays. But this aspect combining these facts with the fact that the accelerators seem so uh, uniform in a way in terms of their capacity in rigidity is to me very puzzling maybe i just haven't thought about it right mm -hmm. but the main the a very key conclusion of these of this work with see the whole thing of this is relying on the comprehensive picture that um there's a relationship between the sub ankle composition and that that's coming from disintegration of of primary uh higher higher mass nuclei yeah um, more more complete disintegration is producing the protons and so on anyway that getting the right mix of disintegration versus non-disintegration and getting the shape of the spectrum so i could have shown you maybe back here let's see if i can do that I'm not sure that it's letting me go backwards. I don't know why it's not. Um, well, I think I think that that we can we can continue. Okay. Okay. Time. Anyhow, I was going to for questions. I just wanted to say that the um, it's really quite constraining because the, all that little structure in the spectrum maps onto this information about the temperature, for example. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So let me open the floor to questions. There's one, um, Jishui uh, Tian, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I want to ask uh, about the rigidity cut, uh, uh, whether it's a observational constraint or it's uh, just from the theoretical modeling. Well, I would say it's observational. And by the way, it's not a cut, but it's a kind of um, focus maybe. It seems to me that the data is really showing, and I'll go back to showing you what the data is, um, that at any given energy, there's a very narrow range of nuclei contributing. So let me go back to that discussion. 
Um, here. This was, and this is the data, right? So what I was talking about here is where does the shower peak in its depth? So each individual shower, as it's the fluorescence light is getting emitted, first there's only a few particles of really high energy, and then they multiply and have lots and lots of particles at low energy. But it's generally the, it's basically the current, you know, charge times velocity that governs the fluorescent yield. So as the models, so this is a very good measure of what the composition was. And then the key thing is that there's not, this is not a factor of a hundred bigger, because the thing I wanted to emphasize is if you had a big spread like proton to iron, then there's roughly a hundred, uh, there will, the X max in addition to all of the intrinsic things, which are of order 10 or, or, or 50, in addition, there's this extra spread just because of the different masses. So what that turns out is that in the fits, um, to fit this narrowness of the, and, of, and, and in particular smallness of the, X, of the spread in X max at any given energy requires there not to be a dramatically wide spread. Roughly speaking, it turns into this factor of three spread and rigidity. So I think this is really uh, the result of, of data. The exact interpretation of what the composition is, you know, what is the rigidity here depends on is it is is it silicon or is it uh, sodium or something, but um, you know there could be small shifts in your interpretation of what is the rigidity, but the general phenomenon of the narrowness I think is re very robust. And puzzling to me. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I mean, not puzzling for an individual uh, object, but for the ensemble of objects, it puzzles me a lot. Any other questions? Uh, Brian, please, please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Gladys. Could you say something about the um... Certainly in, in, in this context here about the supposed, I know it's not quite five sigma yet, but the Centaurus A hotspot. Um, yes, I don't believe it's coming from Centaurus A because it would be in a different position. On the other hand, something I didn't go into, the, the particular interpretation of the anisotropies, let's see if I can find that slide. Um, the, so oh, this maybe shows Oh, oh, great. This shows the illumination. I, I went through this too very fast, but these are the illumination maps from the most in, in galactic coordinates from the most nearby 40 megaparsecs. And this is the next distance, 40 to 80 megaparsecs and so on. And um, I forget what the dots are. They mean something that I've forgotten. <laughs> Anyhow, after they're processed by the galactic magnetic field, that turns in to this prediction uh, and this prediction at higher energies for the illumination maps are extremely insensitive to energy, but the uh, observation maps are very sensitive because they're putting this threshold. And so this is forcing you to have higher rigidities. But in any event, um, but, but by the way, if I were to plot the rigidity spectrum at each of these different energy thresholds, they're remarkably similar. It's because, right, it's, it's sort of unintuitive. And that's why I wanted to stress it so much, because I think people are so accustomed to thinking in terms of energy. So we have very different energy cuts here. And the intensity of the anisotropy, this is the observation um, and the predictions, um, the intensity is is sensitive to uh, to the energy, but the actual rigidity spectrum. If we were to take these two data sets, and, and I, I have slides like this, I should have included them. It's amazing how similar they are. It's this little rigidity peak, and it's about uh, a factor of two wide. Um, I I tried to use. By the way, that's something that's very characteristic of 
of transient sources, which has been something I've been fond of, possibly as tidal disruption events, for example. I, I, we, we went through and we tried to say to ourselves, oh, could they actually be uh, somehow due to some mismeasurement, could they actually be um, GRBs and protonic sources? Uh, we really can exclude that to very high uh, uh, possibility from these anisotropy uh, considerations. But anyhow, um, Oh, I, did I lose the train of thought I wanted to put? Um, remind me what we, your question was. Oh, oh, I, about Central the hotspot. So what you see is the Sen A is right there, but that's totally compatible with where you expect um, the it to be from this illumination map. Because because of the cosmic def because of the deflections. If I went back and showed you the deflection maps, let's see where's a picture of that uh, here. But, but sorry, Dennis, isn't it's, isn't your illumination? It shows illumination. how Sen A is deflected. You see that Sen A gets deflected down, and so if it was Sen A, we would be seeing it lower. And you can look and you can see that just the Virgo region deflects down into Sen A. But there's certainly a hot spot there, but is it coming from it's not I don't think it's coming from Sene. That's my objection actually with the starburst analysis I, I didn't mention that in much detail, but those analyses ignore the magnetic deflections are so significant and. Um, and in fact there's only one object and it's perfectly well described as some different object that wasn't a starburst galaxy that got deflected down into that one position. I mean, the, both the AGN and the starburst uh, associations are largely driven by just one hotspot. Did that answer your question, Brian? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, yes, I think, I think I have a clearer picture, thanks. There's a lot of, by the way, that's a very personal view, as you could, as you could tell, but I guess there's room for that. Thank you, Glennis. I think I think we're going to have to make that the last question. We are out of time, uh, but thank you um, very much, Felix. You you have your hands raised, so I'm going to make you the last question. And uh, I can hang around and ask, yes. ask questions if anyone wants to. I don't have something I have that's, to do. With that's it. great. Thank you. And uh, Felix, go ahead. And I'm going to make you host, Felix, because I have to leave at in a minute or so. Yes. Thanks, Rashmi. So, uh, Glenis, the question is the following. I mean, what we see uh, with the spectrum, there are some uncertainties. Uh, even we, most of us, believe more in data, in results or from Roger. Still, I mean, we could not ignore this uncertainty, which is quite large at the end of the spectrum. Is This comes at 10 to 20, even factor of three, four, five. What? No, 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 but this is in, no, the, in the in the common declination band is where you really I think you see that there is a discrepancy observationally. But but you said the common is the very large statistical area. That's here. This is what I'm showing right now. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm just saying that there seems like there's a discrepancy and that that's enough to explain the discrepancy that you can measure well, but with low statistics in the comma declination band, but it's very robust because it's the same astrophysical sources. Yes, this is more is or less there. It's perfectly way. compatible with explaining all of this. I, maybe I didn't say that very clearly. It looks dramatic, right? In in this plot, you might get excited and say, "Oh, there's a difference in the northern sky." Because when you look, take all the statistics, it looks like there's a really big discrepancy, but that's totally consistent with the measured discrepancy in the common declination band. That, I didn't say that very well, or, but maybe I'm not hearing your question properly. No, it's just uh, the, uh, it is correct. You got it, but nevertheless, I mean, so uh, if we r r uh, relate this discrepancy for the old sky to the two different um, uh, regions observed by two de de detectors. So, and the common region statistically is uh, a bit not uh, well uh, 
provide it. So what what is going to happen the next? So that that is my question. So of course, if compare, we should compare the common region. And uh, how many years you would need to get uh, the error bars like for the old sky? So I actually suspect based on what I understand about TA and what they're they're doing and able to see is that once they um, have been able to measure their aerosols, that then they will uh, re they will conclude that the energies are a little bit lower than what they were thinking, and that will bring it into agreement. Yeah, but but still, we we need probably uh, if if it's this. That's not a statistics question, right? That's a matter of. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, yeah. statistics always helps to get rid of systematics because you can do more studies. No, this is clear. So, question is that what if you relate this difference to the the, the, the different regions? Then uh, my question is: Should now be uh, this is uh, some motivation to observe uh, this this common region much more in order to get uh, because this serious serious explanation if it's this true then it means really we see different sources from north and south oh that would be so exciting of course and it's not crazy that we'll be able to see better things of course it's not crazy it is it is reasonable because most of sources could be quite nearby so they right. could be this kind of and furthermore but, our view from the north is toward the anti-center of the galaxy and so it's much less smudged and smeared and confused by the magnetic deflections because the, there's just less magnetic field out there so it's definitely a wonderful direction to look if you want to look for sources oh i should have mentioned i, I don't know what happened to all those slides <laughs> yeah, i went over them too fast but the significance of both of ta's hot, original hot spot um in the sort of m82 direction um, has dropped dramatically and it's only at three sigma now it was up pushing five sigma, I think, at one point. But as these things seem to do, it's gone away. Now they have another hint of another hot spot, uh, more, but it's in an area that OJ should see something and OJ sees nothing. So my guess is that's also statistical. Um, what I did want to say is that one could fit this and apply that as a correction. And then you would see, I believe, that there's in the in the all sky data, there's no discrepancy at high. So I think that if you wanted to try to argue that there is a discrepancy in the in the astrophysical sources, that would be. I don't think you could successfully argue it at this point because of the common declination band. Of course, I should say yes, we want more data in the common declination band, but that comes in proportion to the total observing time. Uh, and, and by the way, OJ now has these radio telescopes, so it will have essentially equivalent of the fluorescence information, even for daytime uh, events. So that'll be very powerful too. Um, OJ, a TA was really set back badly by COVID because they were trying to uh, install the TA times four, where they were multiplying by four their ground detectors, which will greatly uh, improve their statistics. Um, Oh, and but that all has you know just slowed down. I, I think that they're they're working on it, but I don't know how close they are to being finished. So uh, uh, again, my my question is just what is going to happen for next few years? Because we still have this most exciting part. Let's say okay, some uncertainty. I mean, we should not debate is big or not. We see what is that. Uh -huh. and, right the we don't know still there are hot spots or not so what should be done for example if you increase factor of two uh, the um, statistics then probably think even we forget the telescope array i mean just just even taking only Roger. so it should be another 20 years to get some more certain answers to these questions? Um, 
No, I, I think that it's progressing faster than that. One of the things, so there's two different questions I, I think you're asking. One is this, this question of the, of the northern sky. And for that, I think the only solution is for TA to be able to be better at their energy resolution. And they're working very hard on that now. Internally, for example, now I understand that at the upcoming ICRC, they're going to talk about, uh, about that. And um, then once that's more robust, and, and, and this problem of the atmosphere not being the same every night and, and is one that can be tackled. But previously, they weren't making the same detailed measurements as OJ. And so I think that there's a, I mean, the right solution is to lobby the Japanese leadership like Ojo uh, san and, and uh, encourage him about how important it is. Because the, the US side is not, I mean, Frank, I think it's not, it's just by itself, it's just too big a task to tackle. Um, you know, conceivably, a, a productive thing would be for OJ and TA to sort of combine forces to, you know, to help with the with almost manpower uh, issues that TA has to do better atmospheric monitoring. And, and now they're, they've done a lot through these working groups to improve the analysis and so on. For many years, they were stuck with this ancient 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 shower modeling and they were using the shower modeling to infer their uh, acceptance and so they were so dependent on the, on the model that in the end is is what was the sort of origin of the problem but anyhow as they have you know it just takes a huge amount of people there's more than 400 people on OJ and I and I think there's you know like a quarter of that on TA or something anyhow hopefully TA maybe the Japanese side maybe the US side will put in extra effort and and be able to do more with the TA data um, in the meantime right it's the TA error bars that are dominating this um, this, this topic of of north versus south um, what else is doing? There are some OJ detectors that are on the TA side, and there's some, uh, I, I don't know what the status is. There was um, talk about like actually sharing the event data so that both groups can analyze it. But at the very least, it'll be able to, to test the efficiency of the simulator tanks versus the water tanks. Um, and then in, T in OJ, the exciting thing is that with these, uh, this, 24 hour radio detection, which promises uh, event by, oh, you know, the other thing I forgot to say is there's been, and I have to go back because I, I meant to mention this early on. Um, when I was, where is it? When I was showing you the X max distributions, it wasn't here. Wait, where is it? Oh, composition here. Remember, I mentioned that the, these these points are going very, very far. It's been a really exciting development in interpreting the OJ ground array data because people now have used AI. And as you could imagine, there's a huge amount of information in the atmosphere, in the ground shower that's not captured in that old fashioned, simple minded one parameter estimator. And so people can infer the X max quite accurately just purely from an SD event. And that's uh, what's enabled this to to be extended so far. But what that means is, if you can, on an event by event basis, have a good guess of what the X max is and therefore its composition, you could systematically pick events that are very high rigidity, uh, because you would demand they be very light. And then you can do much better pointing, even with Auger, right? The, the problem with the deflections is that we're the, uns, the, the most, the, the largest number of events have low rigidity, but there are certainly some in there that are high rigidity, and those will start increasingly to be possible to pick them out individually. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, since uh, Reshmi left, let me ask, there are some questions, although we are beyond the one or one half. Beyond uh, questions, if there are questions still, please. Uh, so it seems no more questions. So let's thank Glenn again for a nice talk.
Thank and, you. Uh, just to again, as, as you said, this was a last hour lecture for this semester. So we will come up with a new program and probably a bit different format, but that will be announced later. So thank you all of participants. And everybody should feel free to email me if they have questions or want to Zoom or something. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn.